Uh, good morning. Uh, we are here for another episode of the UP ICW's Akdang Buhay series, and I am here to interview Professor Jaime Ann Lim, former dean of the College of Arts and Sciences of the Far Eastern University and a former professor also of the Mindanao State University Iligan Institute of Technology. So um, Dr. Ann Lim uh, is a prolific writer and he has produced uh, works in a number of genres, including poetry, short stories, um, literary criticism, and um, children's literature. So, sir, among the genres that you are working in, which are you? Uh, which genre do you are you most comfortable in uh, the writing process? I like writing different things, and so I really love to write poetry. I also love to write fiction, critical essays. So, at different times in my life, I would write different things. So it doesn't mean that I. Uh, I have a preference for a, spe a specific genre, and that is shown by my production. I have books on different genres. Uh, so, sir, if we talk about your poetry, you have two poetry collections, um, Auguries, which is the more recent one, uh, published by the USD Publishing House, and then uh, earlier, uh, Trios, which is published by University of the Philippines Press. Among the poems that you have written in these two collections, or which do you prefer the most and why? And perhaps you can tell us the circumstances behind the writing of this particular poem. All right. Um, I write different things. I write uh, things that appeal to me uh, as an artist. In other words, uh, I write about the creative process. And so uh, the poem that I picked as my, it's not really a favorite, but uh, it's a poem that I like, is uh, Smoothing the Stone. It's not a personal uh, poem. Uh, I have written poems about my granddaughter, about my daughter, about my wife, but this poem is about the art of writing poetry. It's an ars poetica. As you know, writers eventually come to deal with their own process of writing. So they uh, eventually write some sort of ars poetica. In other words, uh, a discussion of their own poetic practice. And so I would like to read perhaps uh, Smoothing the Stone. This is included in my first uh, poetry collection. It's um, it's one of the three poems that are uh, called uh, Variations on a Theme because the theme is on the writing process. But this poem is not very well known, but it's close to me because I thought that I have done uh, fairly well in developing the idea of the Ars Poetica. As you know, Ars Poetica started with Horace, the Roman poet of the uh, 8 BC and he wrote Arts Poetica and essentially discussed the key concepts in his writing of poetry, which includes the, uh, the wise choice of subject matter and the appropriate use of language. So uh, that's for Horace. And then we have the, uh, the famous Vilia, uh, Lyric 17. First, a poem should, must be magical then musical as a seagull. And then he went through uh, different steps. A uh, uh, poem should be slender as a bell, a uh, poem should be this and that, etc., etc. That's Jose Garcia Villa. Then we have uh, MacLeish, Ars Poetica. And uh, essentially he talked about uh, what a poem is. And he said, for all the history of grief, an empty doorway, and a maple leaf. So he said, a poem must not mean, but be. So that is Ars Poetica. I have my own version of my Ars Poetica, and basically what I want to emphasize here is the, the practice of revision as uh, an important element in the creation of poetry. 
revision, revision. That is an idea that I got from the tiempos, the Silliman, during my Silliman University days. So I would like to read this. I don't know if you can get the idea any, uh, right away because I use metaphors instead of statements, but I use several images that would create the, that would propose the idea of revision. And so I, let me just read this to you. This is not a very long poem. And uh, I'm hoping that this would become more popular, especially in writing, uh, writing classes, creative writing classes, because I think uh, a lot of people don't realize how revision plays an important role in the uh, creation of art. No? So smoothing the stone. The light sleeps under the skin of the river stone. What brings out the fire in the feldspar, the tiger in the agate, the rose in the quartz, is the persistence of desire, the intractable will of light invisible things, wind and water, for instance, which seem to bend, break, dissipate in themselves, only to return again and wage again the gentle assault on the kingdom of the hard and the dark. The light may yet inherit the earth. Observe how prayers hollow the hardwood pew to holy glow. How the root hairs open the blind rock. How the rain water sets and alters at will the folds in the raiment the granite mountain wears. How the wind leaves the shape of its fateful passage on rounded shoulders of century trees. So will water hands smooth these road stones, and wind fingers sift these rough words, smoothing and sifting, smith sifting and smoothing endlessly till they shine. That's the art of revision. That's my Ars Poetica. Uh, so I like, the, I like the poem because it has a tradition, it has a history. In other words, I'm, I'm making conversation with the dead poets in the past. Uh, I think uh, it's important to remember that writers do not exist in a vacuum. They're not born you know, for the first time in this moment, but uh, they have a kinship with writers in the past, you know? And so you try to find out their own contribution to that ongoing conversation, the, the present with the past so and the future. Interestingly, so you have another um, Ars Poetica poem, which is actually a caveat to young writers, uh, which I thought when I was starting out as a writer myself was very interesting and very uh, helpful, but at the same time also a reminder about always the dangers of uh, engaging in the craft of uh, poetry. I'm referring to winding to a poet. poet. This is part of the, the three, because I, I tend to use uh, the trios, the idea of uh, the three poems addressing more or less the same theme. But this is the second one in the trios, in the trio, you no? Know, warning to a poet. So essentially, the idea is, well, writing is great, you no? Know, but you cannot, you cannot expect that this is going to be pleasurable, and uh, lucrative, profit. Uh, you will benefit so much from your writing. It's not, and so you might have the illusions that uh, it's, going to, it's going to be a dream, a puppy's dream, no? But it's not. Uh, writing is always a struggle, and uh, what you get from your writing is not necessarily all gifts, but sometimes uh, pain. And that is my warning to a poet. So essentially, I think uh, when you write long enough, you realize that uh, writing is not like business. 
in business, if you are successful, then you become rich. If, if you are a writer, you become successful. Um, there is a very, very little chance that you will become a national artist. How many national artists for literature do you have every year? Uh, in a good year, you have one. So it's better if you want to get rich, you better go into business because you have so many successful businessmen in a year. Right? So, I mean, writing is really a sacrifice. But people who want to become writers cannot help it. They have to write because it's their life. It's like, uh, it's like breathing. You cannot to live, you have to breathe. And to, uh, for a writer, you have to write because it is in your blood. And uh, you're happy if you are able to do that. But uh, if not, then it's like you are denying yourself. It's like, uh, you know, it's your life, but you're not giving any voice to your life. Maybe so you can like read the last uh, stanza of the poem, uh, of this oh, poem. All right. It and says, this. choose well, my friend. There is no escape, remember. No coming out unbruised, as I sadly learned from the house of the muses. So you are bruised, you are marked, you are changed in some ways when you go into when you dedicate yourself to writing, Correct. right? I mean, uh, you as all writers, and uh, to some extent, they suffer from their writing also, uh, in terms of their well, financial standing, in terms of their uh, family, probably. They could not uh, give uh, time to the family. So that sort of sacrifice is always there when you write. Um, so regarding this collection, I've also noticed that you have uh, used some of the concepts or principles of uh, concrete poetry, like in Warning to a Poet, and even in the poem, uh, The Sorrow of Distances, which is dedicated to Jamila, your daughter, who's also my friend. Yeah. So can you explain uh, that fascination for concrete poetry? I'm a very visual writer. In other words, when I write words on a page, I look at the effect of the words, the arrangement of the words on the page. And so if you look at Warning to a Poet, it looks like a bird, no? Yes. And then, the, in other words, the shape of the poem on the page is part of the meaning of the poem. And so you have to be careful in the arrangement of your lines because sometimes they may convey unintentionally uh, ideas that uh, is not supposed to be there. So you have to be conscious in the arrangement of the, in the arrangement of your lines, in the arrangement of your words. Concrete poetry is like that. Uh, I've been, I studied concrete poetry and therefore I, I was very, very, I was very aware of the effects of the arrangement of words and lines on a page. So part of my aesthetics, I guess, is the idea that uh, physical appearance of the words and lines would constitute part of the meaning of the poem. Um, is it partly because you're also a visual artist, a painter? And then I think three of your poems here are about painting, including one about Rousseau, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, that says a lot about, uh, you know, you cannot help it. It's in your character. Uh, you are uh, aware of visual relations, patterns. And I am like that. I can look at a scene and uh, see a sort of pattern right away uh, in terms of the verticals or horizontals or uh, in terms of the repetition of certain colors. So I am that kind of person. 
I cannot help it but uh, notice things like that. So I'm always, always uh, aware of the visual qualities because, uh, because I'm also an artist. If, in fact, in fact, if I did not write, I would go into painting. I would go. I would be an artist. If uh, I could say from my childhood, I could say that uh, art has been the primary interest of my life. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, if I had little money, I would buy crayons, coloring pencils. I mean, options that other kids would probably not make. Um, because I was fascinated by colors and just drawing things. So I'm an artist uh, because I have that character. I have that inherent uh, talent, probably, or uh, sensitivity towards visual elements. Okay. Sure. Um, with regards to your second book of poetry, this one is arranged according to three um, poems that are of a related theme, thematically uh, connected, and they're like about 15, if I'm not mistaken, 15. So um, what's the difference between uh, trios and auguries, uh, aside from its uh, very foreboding <laughs> title? <laughs> All right. I think if you study this, very carefully, this is more like uh, it's free willing. So I was trying to get away from the rigidity of the trios pattern. No? So three, 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 the same theme uh, for 15 poems. So in this uh, collection, I was playing with a lot of things. Uh, unpredictability, for example. Uh, I wrote the poems. And I could easily group them into related themes. I did not do that. Intentionally, I rearranged the poems and sequenced them in such a way that they become unpredictable. The sequencing is not logical. So if you notice that, that is, that is part of my strategy because one of the things that I learned from reading many other poems is that poetry is not always logical. It's not always linear. So what I, I have here is a sense uh, a collection of episodic poems. So one poem would be about uh, environmental degradation. The second poem has nothing to do with environment, but something that is internal, no? So, I was hoping for that kind of uh, surprise, no? So, when you open uh, the pages, one poem would be like this, followed by something that is entirely different. And so you might think, well, this is a little bit disjointed. That is precisely the effect that I would like to, to get. Um, one writer, one poet that really influenced me so much in the writing of this collection is... Uh, Nick Lance. Lance. Uh, you don't know? You don't know? I have that question. Yes. It's a beautiful book. And the... Uh, and the beauty of that book is that it opened my eyes to a lot of possibilities that I never considered possible. No, when you are uh, when you are uh, trained in the Silimanian uh, art of writing, you know that uh, a poem should be logical. It should uh, proceed from uh, point A to point B to point C. So the journey or the narrative arc is quite clear. Now, in Lanz, sometimes the poem is just made up of a series of metaphors, for example. And metaphors, after metaphors, after metaphor, and 
you don't have any conclusion. That is the, that is the entire poem. And so I thought that uh, it's possible to do it that way. Uh, in other words, you don't have to have a story. You just have to have lines. And for example, let me just, let me just read out to you some of the things that you would say, where is this coming from? Where is this moving to? No? Because it's not, it's not logical at all. It does not move from A to B to C. It's just a series of lines. It's about the different uh, parang dependent clauses, a series of dependent clauses. All right, this is one, the dubious art of the non sequitur. The non sequitur doesn't follow, it's illogical, no? If the bird of perilous passage alights on your rest bone like a question, then there is a running dialogue between careless sea and the shore. I mean, where is the connection? There is no connection. And if you say, oh, this poet, there must be something wrong with the thinking of this poet, but that is, you know, you are trying to push the envelope. You're trying to go into a territory that, that has not been explored well. The idea of the mysterious connection or the non-connection at all, no? If the sky pours an avalanche of whirling stars over your head, then there is a quiet stillness in the cold trickle of the flowing forest stream. Where is the connection between the sky and the stream? There is none. And so I went through this process um, systematically. Uh, I thought, where would, it, where would it end? How far could I, how far could I go in being illogical? No? So writing this collection has really been a real joy because it was an adventure. I was testing the currents and unfamiliar currents and I got that from from Lance. So um, I think a lot of times we are uh, we are bound by what we learn in school and what we learn is one thing at, but uh, the idea of art as an open territory is something that uh, all writers should explore. In other words, go beyond what you have been doing. And so I think Ogoris did something like that. I have not seen any poetry collections recently or in the immediate past that tried to do that. It's always logical. There is always a narrative arc that you can, that you can follow. But uh, try looking for poems that don't have that. It's only in this book. I don't know if people realize this, or the poets who write realize this. They might think, oh, he's losing his head, or <laughs> something like that, because, <laughs> because that's precisely uh, what I was trying to do. But I had a great, uh, I was able to write this in one year's time. And so you talked about the process. The process is really quite simple. If you, if you set up a system, you say, for example, uh, I have to produce 50 to 60 poems. That was what uh, Jack Wigley said. Uh, you submit a poetry collection to USD Press. They look at a collection of at least 50 to 60 poems. So I said, all right, if I have to produce 50 to 60 poems a year, how many poems do I need to write every month? So every week. And so I try to, uh, I, I don't have, it's not really so much work. All you need to do is just write uh, a couple of poems every week. So in four, uh, in four weeks, how many 
do you have? And then in one year, how many do you have? And uh, because I was trying to, to get beyond the personal, so it's not just about my life, about my wife, about my, about my daughter, but uh, about something else. The internet is uh, one, one source of, you know, you have all sorts of stories, uh, YouTubes, and I saw horrendous things happening, which burning in Africa, uh, the killing of albinos. I mean, these are not made up stories, but they are, uh, they are real stories. And I thought when I was, you know, reading them, when I was uh, watching them, I thought, oh, this is terrible, terrible. And you react to that by writing your own poem. So, so I have some terrible poems here as well uh, in terms of subject matter. You know, uh, people who would be punished because of blogging, I mean, that sort of thing. And uh, people would be buried alive because they are sus suspected of being witches. I mean, how can people do this? And that is happening all the time. A su superstition, religion, these are forces that can result in tremendous tragedies. So I reacted to that. I have a, a lot of that here and uh, a lot of things that are fairly, fairly um, beautiful, you know, very quiet very loving, and then you have horrific uh, poems, and uh, the halo halo, the mixture of its different uh, qualities. You no, know, I was hoping that it would come up, come out as something surprising. Sir, so, uh, but uh, despite the disparity and desperateness of some of the subject matter um, written about in the book. Um, there seems to be still an organic unity to the collection, and I suppose it has something to do with the sure-footedness of uh, the cadence, as well as the clarity of the voice, which I think a poet would develop um, in his practice, if he has been practicing the writing of poetry for such a long time. Well, I'm happy that you you are able to see that, you know, I think uh, you are always there. Although the poems are uh, not necessarily autobiographical in the sense that they do not necessarily address specific incidents or experiences in your own life, uh, there is an element of autobiography in the sense that it's your sensibility that is working in the poetry. So whatever, whatever is the subject matter, whether it's a sad uh, personal subject matter or something that is global disaster, uh, if you are writing about it, you are writing from your own perspective and uh, sooner or later your voice will come out because it's your sensibility that is working. That is why I think all writing is autobiographical, whether you realize it or not. Sir, uh, shifting to your fiction, uh, the same question that I asked for the poetry, like, uh, which of your fictional pieces uh, do you like best in terms of probably its success uh, for you as a story, right, a short story writer, or maybe um, which story did you enjoy most in the writing process? All right. I like the homing mandarin, and not necessarily because I enjoyed writing it. In fact, it's the one story that gave me a lot of problems. It took me a long time to write this story. It took me nearly 10 years, 15 years. The homing mandarin is basically very, very largely autobiographical. Uh, I'm a mestizo Chinese. My father was a pure Chinese. He was married in China, had a family there. 
came to the Philippines as a businessman and in the meantime took on a wife, you know, a common law wife. They were not married, but anyway, had children. And eventually, my mother died and my father got sickly and his friends decided to help him go back home. So, and so he went home and abandoned us. And that was, that's the story of the homing mandarin. It was, it's a painful, you know, personal experience. If you realize, I was, how old was I? I was in college. It was first year, second year college. And uh, they said they had to go, he had to go home to recuperate and all that. But uh, all the time, we were made to believe that he was going to come back. But, of course, over the years, I realized, or the main character in the story realized, and also realized that he was not coming back. And it's like this, no? Where is your home? Home is where you prefer to die. I mean, that's true for Chinese. That's true for Filipinos. If you know where your home is, you don't want to die in a strange land. You want to die at home with your relatives, your loved ones around you. That is what happened in the story. And so the characters in the story had to come to terms with that, that their father belonged to another place. The home is not the Philippines for him, but it's China for him. So we had to accept that. So this story is made up of basically that question, is he coming back or not? And so the structure of the story is not one linear flow from beginning to end, but it is episodic. It is broken up into sections, sections. What I remembered about my past, so uh, they uh, came in there. You know? there, is some, there is some sort of organic design, but uh, essentially it is a memory story. And uh, because it's a memory story and based on my real life, uh, it's a little bit painful at the same time. So I like the story because it's the most meaningful to me. Not necessarily because it took, uh, it was easiest to write. Some stories took me only a week to write from beginning to end, no? Uh, completely polished already after a week. But this one took me a long time because I had to grapple with my memories. And, uh, you know, if it's painful, it's close to you, it's very difficult to just write it down on paper. You have to process it. And it took me a long time to process it. And in the end, I like it because, like I told my sister, nobody will remember us. We are ordinary people. Nobody will remember us. We are not leaders. We are not uh, big businessmen. And so our history is circumscribed by the realities of our own lives. Sabi ko, but I've written our family history. And for as long as this story uh, exists, you know, we are remembered in the story. Because the story, it's our life story. So I like it because uh, I was able to do something that uh, a lot of people have not done. Siguro, a lot of ordinary people, di ba? When they die, they disappear from the world and that's it. Di ba? Nobody will remember them. I mean, who, who would remember you after 20 years, after 50 years? Nobody. Because ordinary people are like that. We are we are really disdained for oblivion. But if you are a writer, and that is the big, the big plus for writer, because you can write and your words can outlast your own life. And for as long as your word you endures, then the memory, your memory also endures. 
So you are remembered through the words. So that that story is my family history. You no, a lot of there are a lot of Filipinos who are uh, who are like me. You know, we have a lot of Chinese businessmen who, who come to the Philippines. They marry and then they go back to China, where the real families are. And so I am giving voice to the reality of many Filipino or oh, Chinese Filipinos. So for a long, for the longest time, when I was a kid, you know, I went to Chinese school. My father was a, a successful businessman. Um, but eventually the business went bankrupt. He was a gambler. Uh, he liked playing mahjong. When my mother died, the business disappeared. And the six of us kids were uh, distributed. We were not together. We did not grow up together. We were distributed to friends, relatives who would take us in. It's parang hindi naman paying borders, but we were just distributed. And so I stayed with my uncle, my sister and I stayed with an uncle, Chinese uncle, the brother of my, my father's wife. But my other siblings stayed with my Filipino relatives. So that kind of dysfunctional family is supposed to happen a lot. Sir, um, <coughs> do you like have certain uh, rituals uh, before the actual writing process? Like, um, do you like, uh, let's say, watch a film, uh, tend the garden, clean the house, or, um, or drink a bottle of wine before actually uh, writing? Uh, going into the writing pro itself? All these rituals, I think, are a way of postponing the writing <laughs> act. So I have a little of that, but not compulsively. In other words, I just make sure that I have the basic needs. For example, early on, I used the bed as my table. So I would lie down and have a bond paper and write. So using either pencil or ball pen, later on I'm, I was going to type this up. No? But so what did I? What did I need? I just had to make sure that the bed is clean, that I had uh, pieces of paper, pencils, and quiet because I'm distracted by noise. So quiet and just. No, no big deal. In other words, uh, I'm not a professional writer. By professional writer, I mean a writer who devotes a specific schedule, like a certain time of the morning, 8 o'clock, you're up, you take your breakfast, and then from 9 to 12, you write. You're in your study room writing, and then from 1 or 2 o'clock up to 6 o'clock, you continue writing. Every day you do that, you know, that's what I consider as a professional writer. But I'm a, a writer that is very casual. In other words, I write uh, if there is, for example, there's a deadline. I have to do this because I have to submit this. So I'll be forced to really be systematic in my writing process. When I was doing my dissertation, I would go to the library. After working and studying, I would go to the library at about 8 o'clock after dinner and stay there up to 12 when the library closes. So I would do that from 8 to 12, 8 to 12 every night, for uh, every day for how many months. So that's systematic. My ritual is just the process. Sir, sir, this is the product of that uh, research. Yes, Maybe you can like tell us a, a little bit about uh, the content of this uh, book. All right. 
I was interested. I took a course called Colonialism in Education. This was not in comparative literature. I was doing two degrees at the same time. One was in education and the other was in uh, comparative literature. But in that course, we took up, uh, it's called uh, Colonialism in Education. And it took, it, it talked about uh, the way colonizers would enter into the educational system of a country and utilize that system to essentially indoctrinate the natives. And so I thought, ah, that was happening to us. And so I was interested in looking at how the experience of colonization you know, affected our people especially through the portrayal of that experience by Filipino writers. So, no Limitangere by Jose Rizal, no. So, I look at that. Oh, so, it's not just, uh, you know, he, Rizal was developing certain characters. He was saying something bigger, the political situation, the way the church becomes central to the life of the nation, and how that reality uh, influenced the idea of the power relations between the colonizers and the, the natives, the colonized. And so from there, you look at different uh, novelists uh, dealing with the same uh, colonial uh, experience. For example, Linda T. Casper, uh, F. Sunil Jose, you know, they all wrote novels dealing with the uh, Spanish colonial period. And then you do that with the American and then the uh, Japanese. And so that's the, uh, I came up with the, the dissertation proposal. And they like it because uh, nobody else was doing it. And in fact, other nations or other writers had been doing it, but not in the Philippines. Nobody did that. And so uh, I said I was going to do it, but they did not have any expert at Indiana University. And so they had to get uh, Lynn Casper from Boston College to be my advisor. So parang, parang long distance uh, advisor si Lynn Casper. Sabi ni Lynn, Okay lang, he, he was willing to be my advisor as long as I was not going to be very, I was not going to be hard-headed. In other words, he came across certain writers who have already uh, their uh, ideological mindsets there, na, complete. Na. So getting any advice from him was going to be very difficult. So I said I, I was going to be very open. So, so why, yeah. why did you end up uh, studying in uh, Indiana University in Bloomington? Uh, and maybe you can tell us about your life in Bloomington, Indiana. Okay. Filipinos, surprisingly, no, have this, uh, I mean, they always like to study abroad. They feel that they have better opportunities. They, uh, experience would be better, that sort of thing. And so my wife who was also uh, a university instructor at MSU, uh, had this professor, Ford Foundation professor in biology. And she was working closely with him, she an assistant. And so when the professor went back to Indiana, he decided to help her get some sort of fellowship to Indiana doing a PhD in limnology. Now, parang sing it kami because we are, you know, they wanted to keep the family intact. Oh, sige, uh, the husband goes with the wife uh, parang dependent. Uh, and also, I was going to be the caretaker of the kids because they were still small and so that was the arrangement she was going to study and I was going to go 
And uh, while there, I was going to look for a fellowship for myself. Um, don't pumunta kami. But when I got there, it turned out that it was going to be difficult for me to get a fellowship. Even though my grades were very good at Silliman University, uh, the uh, foreign advisor told me, why would we give you a fellowship? We have so many already regular students and doing well in the program, and we could not afford to give them all because there are so many of them. Why would we, why would we privilege you? You are coming in raw, and we don't even know how, how your educational background is and your educational training is. So, no, no way. And so right there, I, it's like uh, my whole world fell down. Uh, I would never get a chance to have a fellowship. So I uh, resigned myself to just being a house husband. That was the most difficult experience in my life. If you have been working all your life and suddenly you are forced to stay at home, take care of the kids, cook, do the groceries, do the laundry, clean the house, and everything, it was just, oh my God, I was going to get crazy over this. I could not, I could not take it. I was so miserable. And so, I said, even if I could not study, could I just audit? In other words, pay for a minimal tuition and then attend the classes, not necessarily for credit, but just to listen to the lectures. And so that's what I did. But then this became complicated because when you have kids, what do you do with them? You leave them with a the, uh, babysitter. My daughter at that time was, I don't know, two years old, two and a half, and she did not like the babysitter. She would prefer to stay home. And so I would go to my class, leave her by herself in the apartment, and all the time I was thinking if something happens, she is going to be there by herself. This is terrible. I could not do it. I, you know, we tried it for a couple of weeks and said, this will not do. And so we finally decided to, this will not do at all. But anyway, in the meantime, there were contests, uh, like uh, the Asian student uh, magazine or newspaper in San Francisco had this annual writing, essay writing contest. Uh, for Asian students in the U.S. and Canada. And so they have this, this is the theme, you write uh, five pages or something like that. And so I wrote five pages or the requisite number of pages, submitted it, and then forgot all about it. Many months after, and I forgot, I have forgotten about that, uh, somebody called me from the foreign student office said, I have to have the presentation of the award by the president of the university and the director of the foreign student uh, office at uh, this and that time, that's this place. And I said, what, what, what? And so I went, it turned out I won second place. The first guy was from the University of California. I was the second, Indiana University, third from Harvard. And so it was a big deal. They was going to have a newspaper man there, take pictures and all that. And so when they presented the award to me, I immediately told the, uh, the guy, the uh, foreign student uh, director, I said, I have a standing application for a scholarship in your office. Do you think you can you know, accommodate me? Sabinia, how many years do you want? Come to my office this afternoon. And you can ask. You can, if you want one year, we'll give you one year, two years, two years. You know, it was open suddenly. When, before, they would say, nobody would ever consider me. And so I said, just give me one year because all I need to do is prove to the department that I can do it. So 
After that, I went to the department chair. I said, I won this national competition. So they gave me a scholarship. I was asking only for one year. But you, the department, never considered me for an assistantship. That is what I was looking for. But I'll show you what I can do after one year. So essentially, the chair of the part knew what I was, you know, parang they did not, did not give me because they were not sure uh, if I would be a good investment. But now I was going to prove to them that they're wrong. And so after one year, you won another contest. The, my grades were very good. In one course, that was a summer course, literary criticism. And we are asked to read about 25 different articles and books. And then <clears throat> the exam was like, I'm going to get one section here, one section there, one section there, jumble them. You tell me where this came from, who wrote this, and all that. And if you did not read the entire book, wala ka. But it turned out, because I was concentrating on it, I got nearly perfect. I read the books, I understood the books, and I could tell this passage came from that book, this passage came from that book. I could give the author, I could give the year. And so the professor was really amazed. And because this was not an American student, this was a foreign student, a Filipino student, this small guy who was sitting in the corner of the classroom, and I was on top of the exam. And so, so after, the, after he uh, returned the papers, he said he wanted to meet me. He would like to have lunch with me. So he offered me lunch, and then he talked about that. And of course, that uh, professor talked to the other professors. And so they said, what's, what's out for this guy? He's, he's really good. And so after, uh, after one year, my grades were very high, and they had to give me the associate instructorship. And basically what that is is you study you study full time, but you also have a teaching load, a couple of teaching loads. And then you have to, I mean, you get, it's not payment, but it's a honorarium, $350 a month. So I had that money, free and tuition, and then I can study and I could teach at the same time. So that was how I finished my, my PhD. I was teaching at the same time, studying. But I won all the prizes there, literary prizes, American, American Poets Prize. I entered. I mean, there were a lot of uh, American uh, creative writing students, but I won. And then the fiction writing contest, I won. Uh, they were not, you know, people, I would go uh, buying groceries, doing my groceries, and some of the students would be there, and they say, that's the guy who, that's the guy who's uh, winning the prizes in the English department. And so I, he, they knew them, I got the a reputation, but uh, I was just doing my work. So it was, uh, in some ways, a vindication. I really wanted to prove to them because I felt that uh, although my credentials were very good uh, from Silliman University, they were not really sure about Silliman University. What, what is this school? And so what if you got high grades? It doesn't mean anything. In fact, I got, they were not so sure they had to require me to get another masteral degree. I had a masteral degree from Silliman. It was uh, English and creative writing. But they did not think that that was enough. So they asked me to get a, must, uh, a, a, a masteral degree in comparative literature. 
So I was so pissed off by that. So I go, why, why? Because you don't trust my master degree, I'll prove to you. Instead of just getting one master degree, yeah. I'll take two. So I got to, I went to education, uh, decided to get an MS in structural systems technology. At the same time, my MA in comparative literature, and I was teaching, and I was uh, an assistant there in the educational. Uh, in the College of Education doing uh, photography, uh, you know, things that you do uh, in the in instructional systems technology. I was doing all that, left and the right, and I passed all of them. And just to show you, but the problem now is they had to extend my assistantship because, well, I said, you required me to get another MA, so it took me this many years. Because you have to take the exam, the qualifying exam, and then you have to write your thesis. It was a big sacrifice. For me, it was, it was not an easy PhD. I went there to get my PhD, but it was not easy. They really made me work for it. And I did it. And then afterwards, <coughs> They expected, uh, a lot of people expected me to just stay there. So because, of course, uh, once you finish your degree, uh, you're entitled to stay there to work for a couple of years or so. But no, I said, oh, they would ask me, uh, so you plan to stay in the States and work? And said, no, I'm not here to work. I, was, I came here to study. After my study, I'm going back because this is really my home. I mean, the idea of home is very important to me. I, I could not imagine myself, despite all the, you know, all the comforts in the U.S., I could not imagine myself living in the U.S. Sir, so, um, like, uh, who and what have influenced you the most as a writer? I mean, like, in terms of your favorite uh, writers and your favorite uh, literary masterpieces that have uh, inspired you uh, to pursue the craft of writing? Yeah. At different times in your life, you have different mentors. You know, I read a lot, so to some extent, they are all my mentors. But uh, during my early years, when I was studying at Silima, uh, Mindanao State University, uh, I read Karima Pulutan, uh, Nick Joaquin, uh, in VM Gonzalez, Delberto Tiempo, and so to some extent they were my mentors because I studied their works and I studied them not only in terms of uh, you know understanding the stories like the Virgin of Tovera, but uh, under studying them in terms of uh, the way it's written. I was studying them as a writer, not just as a reader. Therefore, you know, Kirima Pulutan has influenced me a lot. That's, uh, I mean, honestly speaking, no? Because uh, I like her writing, and uh, it, it spoke to me. And so, my early stories, like uh, The Liberation of M Mrs. Fidela Magsilam, you have echoes of Tuvera in that story, no? And so, in fact, uh, there were a lot of people who said, ah, Tubera, Tubera, ganon. But... Uh, it's an homage. Oh, yes, it's an homage. And I entered it in a contest. The first time I entered in the Palanca, I entered it. Uh, Kirima happened to be one of the judges, and it won. No, it won. Because basically it was... Uh, but... Uh, the way it's developed, it's a little bit different. But essentially, it is the idea of somebody, a woman, a widow in my story, who was, was widowed early and therefore could not be fulfilled sexually. And eventually, in the story, had to find her own liberation. So. 
uh, Kirima Pulutan, but also at the same time, so many other, so many other writers and works, especially. No, uh, it's not true that you are influenced by, for example, a writer, and all the works of that writer are equally influential. Uh, in my case, it's always the specific work and uh, for a specific uh, writing need there is this work that is more responsive to your needs so that's the way the influence idea works for me you know, like Lance the poet you know I was writing this poetry book and he just happened to be there and when I read him He's, I, I just thought that he opened my eyes, uh, something that I did not see uh, as, as possible, but it's very possible. And uh, because he is uh, an award-winning poet also. So I'm not worried too much about the idea of influence who influence you. My uh, view, look around, so look around. <laughs> They are all my influences because I'm influenced always by great writing. But uh, I think uh, I would like to mention the series, the Best American Church Stories. I've been following that series for many, many years. And so I would look at the stories and find out why is this story a great American story. So I would have that question and I would look at the story in terms of the theme, but also in terms of the technique, the structure, the voice. In other words, I would be looking at the stories as a writer, as somebody who can get a lot from my own reading. So my reading is not, it's not just for enjoyment, it's always critical. So, um, what are the main thematic concerns of your fiction and poetry? Do they revolve around the same uh, topics or subject matters or uh, situations? Um, my, I think my stories are more strongly autobiographical. In fact, Ian Kasokot was telling me, if I uh, was telling our friends that if they want to understand me, all they need to do is read my stories because I am in my stories, even though the characters are named otherwise. No, because uh, of course, especially in the stories, because uh, for the longest time I was bothered my by my sexuality. I did not understand what that is, and so. If you look at the psychology books, the, the medical books, they would look at it as a pathology, and you are worried that you are like this, that, you know, we came from that culture, we came from that time. And so my stories, my first, uh, one of my earliest stories, the husband revolved around that conflict. So. My other stories have the same conflict also. But, uh, for example, the, the Axolotl colony, it's not very clear why they broke up, but uh, you can sense the undercurrent, the sexual um, mismatch between the husband and wife in that story. So, my only advice to those who want to be, who are in that uh, ambiguous state, to be clear about your path, you know, to be true to yourself and not just be pressured by the social expectations. You get married, you raise children, because you're expected to raise, uh, to get married and raise children and all that, not, not considering the, your own nature because that is going to that is going to make a lot of people unhappy your partner you know and so if i have to i have to 
redo my life if you have you are given that option i would like to be a bit more realistic in accepting who i am and therefore to make sure that, that uh, you know i give primacy to that nature so um so there's a very big uh, difference between, let's say, the narrator or the main character in The Husband and then the main character of the title story of Hedonicus uh, um, in terms of uh, liberation from yes. the norms of society. Remember Ralph. Remember Ralph. Uh, Hedonicus was not really was that something that uh, I wrote on my own. Um, there was this project, book project, uh, to be edited by, uh, edited by Neil Garcia and Danton Rimoto. It's called That Lad. And Ralph, who was a mutual friend of the editors, asked me to contribute a story. Uh, in my ignorance, I submitted a story which had nothing to do with the theme of the book. And so they returned the story and they said, this is not the kind of story we want. So, and so I said, why? What kind of story do you want? You know, I did not know what, me what it meant, you know, what that la meant. I said, lad, lad, oh, lad, lad, okay. And so, no, it has to be like this and like that. Ah, but I don't have any story like that, but I can write a story like that <laughs> easily. And so, this story is really, parang, if you want, commissioned by that book. So, it was intended for that book. And when the, I came up with this, ah, sabi ko, we want to be parang controversial a little bit. Let's make it as a title story. Because if you read that and then you read the rest of the stories, this really is right. this is very different. I mean I have very very wholesome children's stories in that book and it's uh, headlined by Hedonicos, which is a trip to a bathhouse in New York. Located in Wall Street, yes. And uh, because it's easy because it was a personal experience. But of course, I embroidered. Fiction is uh, always embroidered. But the only is one of the most powerful stories in Lad Lad One, if I, I may say so. The uh, a lot of people when I attended the LGBTQ workshop last uh, July, they were. Uh, they remembered that story and they associated that story with me. Not my other stories, but Hedonicus. Really, I enjoyed writing the story. I was laughing when I was writing the story. It was tongue in cheek, but it is. it has a lot of uh, realistic uh, elements in there. If you have not been to, uh, if you have not been to a bathhouse, American bathhouse, Oh, you should probably try it. You will be overwhelmed. But uh, anyway, it was a nice experience. So, so sometimes I see that there is a connection between uh, the thematic uh, concerns of um, the stories and, and the poetry. Like for instance, uh, I just finished uh, rereading The Axolotl uh, Colony last night. And then somehow, um, the sorrow of distances also like resonated uh, in my mind. Huh? So in a sense, where I was thinking these two, um, these two literary pieces were in a way related if they were not written almost at the same period, or probably they are about uh, that particular period in in uh, in your life. Yeah, they are related in the sense that they have the same. There is a daughter character in the poem, central character, right? But uh, in the uh, in the story, there is also a daughter, because uh, part of the arrangement of the husband and wife in the axolotl colony is that the wife is going to stay in the U.S. She was going to marry an American lover, and the daughter would have to stay with her. 
was that the arrangement in my real life? Almost. Almost. And I was just, you know, I said, don't do this to me. You cannot do this to me. We have two kids. If you want, let's divide. One for you, one for me. And if the other one would say no, both of them would have to be with her. I said, no way. Now, if you insist on that, I will do something. And I did something. I asked the advisor to send my wife back to the Philippines. So they cut off her fellowship. And they had to go home. And the advisor, who's a friend of the, the boyfriend, because he was also a professor, told him to hands off. And were they divorced? Yes, we were divorced. So it's very close, it's very, you know, if you look at it, you really realize that I'm not writing fiction, I'm writing a memoir or something, because it's close. But anyway, you should read Hedonicus Joy. It's a, it's a powerful story, but it's a very light. You know, the tenor is it's very uh, joking, very... Uh, so, Jimmy, uh, what do you think will be your, uh, or what do you think is your main contribution to uh, Philippine uh, literature? All right. For the longest time, I have always been interested in promoting Mindanao literature. When I came back from the U.S., I thought this was something that we needed. Uh, I happened to work closely with uh, Anthony Tan, Christine Godinez Ortega, in the department, in the English department at the uh, MSU Iligan Institute of Technology. And uh, I, I did not see any project that was going on. I mean, we did our or teaching and all that, and that was it. And I thought, we needed something more. And what more can we do except to promote Mindanao literature? We are in Mindanao. And the way we, I saw it then, no, uh, Manila was not giving attention to Mindanao. It's like Manila is too, is too busy with itself. And so let's have something like Mindanao Harvest, because New Day at that time, was publishing a series of Harvest Harvest books. No? So let's have Mindanao Harvest. And when we proposed the idea, they were interested. And so that was our you know, initial project. Uh, Christine and I decided we were going to, to be editors of that anthology. And we essentially uh, identified the the leading writers of Mindanao invited them to contribute to Mindanao Harvest. There was supposed to be only one Mindanao Harvest, not Mindanao Harvest 1 and 2, but New Day thought it was too thick and it might be better if we break it into two. And so they decided to break it into fiction, fiction and then poetry and drama in Mindanao Harvest 2. And so that was the beginning. But the justification is always to give a public space for Mindanao writings. Because I don't know if that was a fair assessment. I felt that uh, Manila was not giving any attention to Mindanao writing at all. So even if, you know, even though it was a very small gesture, it was at least symbolically a way of 
asserting our importance by asserting our presence. And this was followed up by Mindanao Harvest 3 uh, and Mindanao Harvest 4. Mindanao Harvest 4 is really a radical, radical change from the previous ones because the previous ones are more or less uh, predictable. The uh, inclusion of certain writers, uh, Antonio Enriquez, Titela Cambra Ayala, Aida Ford, uh, people who have been associated closely with Mindanao writer for the longest time. Uh, Mindanao, uh, Mindanao Harvest 4 uh, came out uh, differently you know, I thought, ah, I'm done with that. I've done my, I've contributed already. Tama na yan. So I was, I was contented. But at one point, uh, Penn International, through its uh, civil society program, uh, sponsored um, a conference on teaching literature. And this was held in Iligan, attended by nearly 100 participants, high school, a senior high school teachers and college teachers from around Iligan, Marawi, around Iligan, again, the Oro. And basically, during that, uh, well, the speakers were uh, Ricky, the Ungria, Christine Gudinis, Ortega, and myself. Uh, keynote speaker was Epson Jose, national artist. So basically, during the during the open forum, it it was raised, but that these teachers had one very serious problem: they did not have any new materials, teaching materials, especially when the with the curricular changes. Uh, given by DepEd and CHED. In other words, the inclusion of 21st century Philippine literature and 21st century regional literature. The books that they have were 20th century. So they want 21st century. So that conference gave me the idea. I mean, we were done with the conference. We we're done with, their, with our talks and all lectures and all that. But I said, we should act on this. Because this is really something that we can do. If we did not do it, nobody else will. And so the teachers would be left on the, to deal with their own problems. No? And so I formulated the parameters of the book project and invited the co-editors. Um, basically, we will make a call for submissions and this will not be limited to the so-called canonical Mindanao writers, but basically open so that we will know who are the writers now. And so we did that. It took uh, some time. And uh, in fact, we had more contributors than we expected. We had to cut. Uh, I was thinking we would have at least two to three poems per poet, but we could not because then the book would become really very thick and therefore uh, financially not advisable. No? So we had to limit to, for a lot of poets only one poem. Uh, and uh, even that, we ended up with over 60 contributors. So poetry, fiction, uh, essays, and plays. But the big, big uh, change is the accommodation of other languages. Before, it was always English. When we talk, when we talk about curricular offerings, we we always think in terms of textbooks, references in English. And so we look at the situation in Mindanao. Well, English is an official language. Filipino is the national language. 
But the lingua franca of Mindanao is Cebuano or Binisaya. So we said we have to include Binisaya as well. In fact, we identified these three languages, but uh, contributors actually send the uh, not just in three languages, some sent uh, in Mindanao, in Mandaya, in the Maranao. And I thought, we thought that it's unfair if we disregard them because they did not follow our uh, re language requirement. As again, let's try to accommodate them because that's the reality of Mindanao naman. No? So, that's how it turned out to be parang it's speaking in tongues, which is the theme of the pen, the international pen this year, speaking in tongues. It just happened that uh, we have so many languages included here. And if you look at the cover, the many colors, the idea that, uh, you know, the idea that uh, we have so many languages, the richness of the region in terms of the languages, no, is there in the cover. And the cover was done by a Mandaya artist, Dani Siliada. So is the, is the establishment of the Iliga National Writers Workshop and then uh, subsequently the Mindanao Writers Group also part of your uh, thrust to make uh, Mindanao writing more visible and more acceptable to uh, the world of literature? Yes. Christine, Tony, and I are products of the Siliman Writers Workshop. And so we got, we are familiar with the structure. And so we thought we might create uh, something like that in Iligan for Mindanao. And what we did was initially to to talk with uh, Cirilo Bautista of uh, La Salle, but he was working then as a bulletin. So we went to bulletin and spoke to him. What do you think? Is this going to be feasible? We don't have any money, but uh, do you think we can get support and all that? And uh, Cirilo was, the, was very, very supportive. And he said, yes, and if you do it this way and that way, you can get support and all that. So we, I always consider Cirilo Bautista as the godfather of the Iligan National Writers' Workshop because without his, his blessings in a way, I thought we would hesitate in establishing something as big as this. But uh, after that, we realized that, yeah, we have to push through with this. Because, of course, UP has, I mean, Luzon has UP and so many other workshops. Uh, the Visayas has Siliman, no? and the Bacolod, the Ias. And Mindanao, now and then, Davao would have a workshop, but uh, something national, something that is more or less permanent, we did not have. And so we really had to think about establishing this. The, before we can do that, because MSU IIT doesn't have a writing program, we cannot use MSU IIT as, as a, I don't know, conduit, a sponsor for the workshop. So we had to create a Mindanao Writers Group. In other words, it's an association of writers from around the area and then we had to create the uh, bylaws and then you had to register this with SEC and all that. And we used the Mindanao Writers Group as the conduit. So that was, that's necessary. Without that, there is no workshop. Sir, uh, I think one of the unique features of uh, the Iliga National Writers Workshop is the fact that it is, I think, one of the few workshops where at a given year, there would be like uh, at least works in five different languages, sometimes six, seven, or even eight. And um, I think it's very different also because it um, you know, caters to the plurality of uh, Mindanao as a region. Um, from 
our experience with the Silliman Writers' Workshop, we realized that there were a lot of things that could be done better. For example, the uh, recording of the proceedings, publication of the proceedings per year with the works and the comments of the panelists. So there is a record, more or less, of the reactions of the receptions of the different panelists, if they were purely new critical in orientation or not, etc. You can find it there. No? Uh, that's one. The other is, of course, the idea of uh, accommodating not only works in English, because that was the, I think, the idea of Silliman, English only. They would not even accept Filipino, no? Uh, and so we said we are going to get away from that. We will be more open. So it's not just that we require, we, are, we were open to a lot of other languages. So if uh, somebody contributed uh, works in Cebuano, we try to accommodate that. In Filipino, the same thing, Iligayno, etc. And therefore, our panelists, of course, had to be conversant in these different languages. So you look at the works that uh, were able to make it to the workshop and decide on that basis who would be some of the panelists that would be invited. So that openness was there. It's part of the structure of the Iliga National Workshops. Later on, of course, like uh, Silliman belatedly accepted Cebuano because of certain reactions. I mean, for the longest time, Silliman was the only one that really persisted in, in accommodating only English. Uh, UP already opened its doors to other languages. The same thing with UST, right? Oh, Filipino, yeah. Oh, Filipino. Filipino, that's it. All right. I'm the only one who can understand All right. another language there. <coughs> but uh, UPS so accommodated Cebuano, right? And so, uh, but Iligan, right from the very beginning, we had uh, multilingual uh, submissions already. And uh, this is something that is, that is good. Because if you do not, you know, it's, if you do not give any space to the different languages, what will happen? What will happen is these different languages will die. We as writers, we have the responsibility to help preserve our different languages. We have 130 different languages. Many of them are in Mindanao and they are in danger of becoming extinct because the writers are not given any space to have their works published and read. And we, at, I, I don't think this is going to be to change the situation a lot, but I think we are at least giving the possibility of, for example, in this anthology, Binisaya or Cebuano, surprisingly, no? Many of the contributors sent in submissions in English, but the next highest number of submissions were in Cebuano, Filipino third, and then the other languages which we tried, accommodating Mandaya, Maguindanao, Maranao, uh, Higaonon, but translated into English. So that kind of openness is at least a positive development. And I think we have, we have held on to this commitment since 1990s, no? from the very beginning up to now. So I think this has started, this book has started, has opened a wider door. Because now the other writers, the other languages would be encouraged to write, not only in the usual languages, but in their own languages.
that's a, a very hopeful, very nice development. Um, so as a writer, is there uh, a, another project that you intend to do, to accomplish, like maybe write a novel this time, like expanding the homing Mandarin, which I think has a lot of episodes that could be expanded and could produce other stories within stories. Yes. And maybe another Mindanao Harvest? I think uh, we will have another Mindanao Harvest in 10 years. By that time, I think, Ralph, you will be leading. Y you will lead the, you know, you will... I mean, you cannot expect uh, I'm retired, Christine is retired, Tony is retired. We are, uh, we are now uh, just enjoying ourselves, uh, rocking the grandchildren, taking care of the garden and all that. And the dogs, but uh, we would have to give way to the younger people, the younger writers. Uh, we have established the parameters, and you can, the blueprint is there, so you can do the follow up. The younger writers can. You cannot do it uh, five years immediately after the publication, or four. You have to wait for uh, ten years, I think. So by that time, you still, you are still young. By that time, and you can do that. Uh, you have enough. Uh, your network is strong. You know the writers there. So keep your connections alive. No. So my next project uh, is not is not uh, fiction. It's not. Uh, Poetry. I'm doing the the enlarged edition of this book. Uh, it's not going to be literature and politics, the colonial experience in nine Philippine novels, because I'm going to include uh, another section. You know, Spanish regime, American uh, period, the Japanese occupation, and then the post. Uh, independence after 1946. So what happened after 1946? The colonial legacy after 1946 is the, the Spaniards are not here anymore, the Americans are not here, the Japanese are not here anymore, but do you think there, what, what is here? What has remained? So the colonial legacy after 1946. So I will be dealing with uh, Roscas Twice Blessed, um, Si Hocos Ilustrado, and uh, Apostles Insurrecto. These are the three uh, new novels that, uh, and these are, this is very good because that will complete the picture. So we are not done yet with colonization. We are now in the period of neo-colonization. We are still being colonized. We just don't realize it. So these novels would show you how, in what way, that is happening. Sir, as a critic, uh, what do you look for when you read a book, be, uh, be it a novel or a book of poetry or a book of short stories? Are there specific things that you look for? Um, I don't go there as a critic. Usually I read as a, could be as a writer or as just an ordinary reader. And if you are the, doing a, a study, a serious literary study, then you start to look for r patterns, repetitions, you know, themes. So. That's how I did the first book of literary criticism. After, after the fact, or when you have the plan. But otherwise, it's not really all that. You know. I read for enjoyment now. I read for enjoyment. Um, I would like to be able to produce another poetry collection, um, another uh, fiction collection. In other words, but uh, time is short and so many books 
And so I'm always so excited when I, you know, when I go to a store and I see a book and I have the money, I cannot help it, but really. So a related question, uh, what, what is your reading regimen? Meaning like, uh, how many books uh, do you read a month? All right. I gave you an advice before, but you know, that was just an ideal. <laughs> I was not doing that for myself. I was doing it for you. Uh, there is no such thing as I have to read, uh, say, two books a week. No. The books are beside my bed, and you can see there used to be a low, uh, short pile of books, and now it is up to here because I would read this, and then you get another book. This is interesting. You, saw, you read the first 50 pages, and you do not finish it, you put it beside your bed. I'm like that. I'm reading, I don't know how many. They are, uh, I have 20, 30 books in the process of being finished. But if time permits, but uh, you know, when I look around and I said, why do I keep, you know, even up to now, I mean, common sense would tell me that I should stop, stop buying books because my place is becoming like a, a warehouse. This is not a good place to live because you are, the books are already, you know, pushing you out of the place. So, but, you know, an obsession is not logical. So an obsession is something emotional. When I see a book, by uh, all right, by Kafka, by uh, so oh, I have to have this. I have to. That's where all my money is. Paintings. Uh, for a while, when I was uh, teaching, when I was working at uh, FAU, I was buying paintings. Buying paintings. This one. Forty thousand. Yung sa taas, 120,000. So when I retired, I said, I'm going to set aside 200,000 just to buy paintings. Um, and uh, are, they become, are they going to become valuable later on? I said, it doesn't have to be. If I like it, that's it. That's the, war the reward. You have to be happy. Life is too short. So being surrounded by things that give you happiness is a form of really taking care of yourself. How can you, I mean, it's stressful enough to live in our country at this time, but if you have other pleasures, take your pleasures, as long as they are innocent, no? And if they are in the form of books, why not? So what uh, advice can you give young writers, those who are just starting out in, in, the, in the craft of writing? Well, I think uh, one of the things that I've come across, a small piece of advice given by great writers, you know, they always say, read. Read. Because uh, even though you don't have any intention of saying, I want to read because I want to learn something new, something useful. When you read, you develop your critical uh, ability to discriminate and all that. Oh, this is beautiful because this is powerful because this is efficient because. So that kind of sensitivity, ability is something that you develop by reading and reading wisely especially some of the best works around. So you, you read and read and read. I mean, if you have, if you have a lot, uh, if you have time, you know, because you have to enjoy other things as well. So, so, so what do you see of the future of uh, Philippine literature as well as the future of uh, Mindanao literature? I, I see it as... Uh, a rosy future. If this is any indication, 
we are discovering writers, you know, who have never been included in a book before. And they will continue writing after this because they could see that through this publication, you are giving importance to their works. So they will be encouraged. You know? So there is a future. But as long as you continue writing, there is a future. You, you <laughs> yeah, because you are one of the, <laughs> the no writer. leader writers. And uh, you keep alive the uh, enthusiasm, the hope that, the, um, but that is our advocacy. We are from Mindanao and we try to make sure that uh, our Mindanao writers are giving space in the national consciousness. Uh, that this is their work, they're writing like this and all that. So it's a happy, it's a very uh, hopeful future, I see. And they are, you know, some of the, especially with, during our last book launch in Iligan, because the book was launched also in Iligan, and the readers read in Cebuano, Binisaya, and there is this instant, instant uh, rapport with the audience. The poet would read the lines and they will giggle, they will laugh, they will react, active, they were, their reception was very good. So the writers in Cebuano would be encouraged. And of course, uh, writers who write only in English now should be encouraged to write in other languages as well, Cebuano. For me, it's too late. It's too late because uh, it's not that easy to just, I know I, I grew up uh, speaking Cebuano, but it's not something that you just use uh, in writing literature. You, you feel that uh, it requires a certain kind of language, not necessarily very formal, but uh, a more uh, a denser, not like uh, pedestrian. Uh, my Cebuano is very, very functional, very pedestrian. Gusto ko ni, gusto ko na, or that's it. You know, you can communicate, you can be understood. But uh, when you write, uh, I think, literary works, you have to be not just one level, but layered. You can be saying this, but you, you actually mean something else. That kind of nuance, complexity. Sir Jimmy, thank you very much for your time and hope to be working with you again in su succeeding books of, uh, that would be pertaining to Mindanao writing. Well, thank you very much, Ralph. You have traveled a lot from my student during your college days to deputy director of the UST Creative Writing Center and Literary Studies. No? So thank you very much. I'm going to read St. Francis with Cats and Sparrows. Neither the sparrows that crowd the church eaves, nor the stray cats that patrol the back alleys, care for the luxury of love's caressing hand. They survive on the berries of necessities, a swarm of insects, a leftover chicken wing, no excess on the side, no trimmings, no icing. Free to roam or fly, they are content to keep hunger at bay, one meal at a time. They don't begrudge you your potted begonias, your modernist furniture, flat screen TV, Japanese car. They don't give a damn about keeping up appearances. When St. Francis opened his arms in the plaza, the sparrows alighted on his shoulders and hands and cleaned the dirt and parasites from their feathers while the cats rubbed their flanks against its legs, licked their paws and peed in the grass. He let them be. 
love is content with that. By the way, the painting behind me is this blue piece called, uh, I don't really know what it's called, but anyway, it is, um, it is an acrylic painting on plywood. And basically, I use the same themes in my other paintings, which is, which is, uh, is a landscape. Um, with the moon and trees and so the uh, this is the latest incarnation because actually underneath this painting there are about five six different paintings that I wasn't too happy with and so I covered up and changed the the scene and so finally this is the version that I like so it is supposedly a very quiet, very uh, mysterious uh, painting. Uh, doesn't have any profound meaning. It's just uh, patterns of blues and white and the horizontal lines, the uh, idea of uh, rest and dreaminess. And you have the trees here. They are supposed to you know, go from close to far, and so the perspective is just uh, rendered this way so that supposedly the bigger trees are closer to the viewer than the smaller trees. But other than that, it's just, you like the color, you like the lines, that's it. The poetry is in the mystery. So, I have not decided yet on the title of the poem or the painting. It could be um, another uh, blue night, moon in the night, or something like that. But uh, the title is irrelevant. I think it's uh, more or less uh, a visual, visual poetry. I paint uh, basically as a sort of uh, change of pacing. When you write, you, you activate certain things in your brain. When you paint, you have the brain, but also the physical activity itself is, is very intense. In fact, um, when I paint, I forget time. So I just... I just paint and paint and I could, I could be painting deep into the night and I would, not, I would not be aware of my involvement in my activity because that's how deeply involved I get in painting. When I write, you have that involvement also but at the same time you are always uh, constrained by certain uh, limitations for example, ideas. You run out of ideas, you run out of uh, expressions, and so uh, you stop. And then you try to recharge. But painting for me is really enjoyable. I mean, I don't even have to be very stressed. I just have to express myself and uh, it's like playing, it's like playing. It's not really work at all. It's just playing with colors and lines. And uh, I have I have lots of paintings actually. At the back, they're there. I, I just you know I just paint and paint and paint. Sometimes when I paint a series, I have about twenty five, fifty different paintings in a series and uh, it's the it's the ideal situation you are interested not in just one art form but in many art forms so my other alternative when I run out of ideas is to pick up a brush and paint like I said I was interested in painting first before I was interested in writing when I was a kid, when I was a kid, when I was in 
first grade, second grade, I was already doing sketches and drawing and uh, coloring and all that. So coloring books were my uh, my first text. So I trained my eyes to see patterns, repetitions of colors, repetitions of lines, and these are visual uh, things, abilities that uh, I carry to my writing. Because uh, poetry, for example, uses a lot of that in concrete poetry or in poetry that has a lot of concrete elements. What I do is I study. Uh, I took up art history and then I took up graphic arts and all that at Silliman and then at Indiana University. I visited museums in New York, in, the, in London, and uh, I just trained myself to, I train my eyes to look and see. So I can look at a painting and say, oh, this is not so good, but this one is good. So I have the discrimination or perhaps it's a personal taste. So I develop my, well, I surround myself with things that I like. And if I don't like, it's that there. And uh, because I want to encourage artists to pursue their art, I buy their artworks also. So I bought that from the artist. I bought this from the artist. I bought several upstairs who have become big names for some reason. You know? My books uh, went to libraries in, uh, in Mindanao. MSU IIT, I gave a collection of my books. Naawan, MSU, uh, high schools in Mantikao. I give books away because that's, that's all we can do as writers. We want to encourage people to read. And so you, you do that by donating your books to different libraries. I donated a copy of Mindanao Hobbies to the uh, your uh, literature and arts library, uh, College of Arts and Literature Library. So, see Mrs. Murillo, I donated a copy of Mindanao Harvest to Silliman University, Xavier University. So I'm always donating books to different libraries because it's a way of really spreading the uh, the achievement of these writers giving uh, importance to the Mindanao writers. But, uh, right now, I am in an, an ideal situation. I am happy. My um, it doesn't make me. I mean, I don't need a lot of things to make me happy. I need simple things to make me happy, and that's enough. I think that's the ideal. It's not, uh, you know, you can be very rich and be very unhappy. It's really knowing what is, what little you need to be happy and to aspire for that. We were abandoned by our father. I was orphaned when I was very young. And nobody saw any future in me, actually. And I was just there. All my uh, playmates were uh, going to school. And I was there in the backyard or in the one, and I was playing by myself, waiting for my playmates to come home from school. And finally, this neighbor of ours, a lawyer, saw me and uh, told my sister, my older sister, why don't you send him to to public school? It's free or not expensive. So, you know, at that point I was I was not schooling anymore, and so my sister decided to go ahead. Bought me new notebooks, a few pencils, and I was my I didn't have shoes, just my slippers. Went to school, and. Uh, grade 5 in the East City Central School in Cagayan de Oro. 
And I did not plan to do well. I just happened to do well. And so I was second placer in my class. So I was placed in the top section during my sixth year and then got high grades also. So got a scholarship for high school. And during high school, I got top grades. I was the lead uh, you know, student in that class and just so on. First year, second year, third year, fourth year. Fourth year, I took the MSU scholarship exam, place number six out of how many thousands who took the exam. And so free tuition, free books, free meron pang allow transportation allowance. So I was I was sent by the government essentially to get my college degree. And all up to PhD. I was not paying for myself. I was I was paid for by the government, by uh, the school. So I'm very lucky to think that this boy who who did not have any future and nobody ever uh, thought that oh send this is a boy to school because he is he has a good head. No. I just I just studied and uh, not too seriously because I tried to enjoy myself also even as a student. So this is where it ended up. That's fine. I'm not very rich, but I'm rich in many other things.